program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Backed by popular demand, we are now offering an exclusive reprint of Volume 3 of God's Minute, 365 Daily Affirmations for Positive Prayer. This unique devotional contains 365 prayers taken from the private prayer life of Dr. Robert H. Schuer, the founding pastor of this ministry. This devotional is timeless and can conveniently fit in your purse or pocket. It will encourage you to spend at least a minute with God every day. With your generous gift of $20 or more, we will send you the exclusive bestseller, God's Minute, Volume 3. But act fast. We are only offering a limited quantity of these devotionals. Call, write, or go online today to request your copy of God's Minute, Volume 3. Now, let's watch the service. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Holy Spirit? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. Well, today uh, we are continuing a series on uh, my new book, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your World, which presents the idea that's not original to me, but one that has made a big difference in my life, and that is that if you want a different life, you need different thinking. Very often we war against the circumstances in our life, you know, where we are, how our relationships are doing, where our job is, where our faith is, but we nurture the kind of thinking that got us there. And it is so important that we understand that when we can learn to train ourselves to think differently, not by trying harder, but through certain disciplines, that we can inherit a new future. It's actually easier to change the way that we think than it is to change the way we behave. And although you can't control every single thought that comes into your mind, you can control what you dwell on. And so today we want to talk about the importance of we've got to learn to love our enemies and, and learn to care for those who, who don't care for us and to have faith in times when things are getting difficult, to be honest, to be brave, that we have to learn that there's a, a change in our thoughts that has to happen before uh, our behavior changes. So we're talking about that, and today we're actually going to talk about a very important part of, of thinking, and that is anxiety and courage, and, uh, and the importance of courage uh, in our moral life, as well as any other aspect of our life, and how without courage, we can't really do anything well. In fact, that's what Maya Angelou said. This is one of her most famous quotes. She said, I am convinced that courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you cannot practice any other virtue consistently. You agree with that? I think Marcus Aurelius said something very similar to that. And it's absolutely true that of all the great cardinal virtues, that maybe the greatest is, we would think it's something like love or peace, or perhaps it's courage, because without courage, all the other ones are impossible. I think today we live in a world that's actually not courageous, but a bit more cowardly, isn't it? All you have to do is go on Twitter or Facebook and see the things that people will say about one another that they wouldn't say to each other's faces. We, uh, we think things and say things indirectly to our neighbors, but then we deny it when people confront us. And in our lives, we feel easily trapped in the same thing that we hate without taking the courage to make a difference in our lives. This is not a judgment on you. I'm just saying that this is how our world has become, that, that it, we're becoming less brave. And today, I want to uh, present uh, something that, I, that is true, and that is that scary stuff is good for us, and that when we do scary things, we actually become less anxious. In fact, this was a point of contention with my publisher. When I put this in the book, they wanted to see original sources, scientific sources, to show that this was true. And it is true, I, I actually dug them up and showed them, that actually, we think that to do scary things raises our anxiety, but it doesn't. Doing scary things actually will lower your anxiety. So in other words, when you need to do something scary, whether it's confront a person, make peace with a person, or even something like go on a roller coaster or pet a snake or something, you know, that, that actually doing those things makes you, over the long term, less anxious and less worried. So very often we think, okay, uh, if I do the scary thing, I'm going to feel worried all the time. It's, it's the opposite. Uh, when you uh, withdraw from scary things, however, 
you get temporary relief, but you, you actually increase your anxiety overall. And so within every sermon during the series, I want us to have new thoughts that we can inherit, things we can meditate on. And the one for today is this. Doing intimidating things will give me greater serenity in the long run. I want you to believe that. If you struggle with worry, with sleeping at night, uh, over things that you may, you, you may in your head be like, this is silly, why am, I, why am I worried about this? I want to encourage you that it's good to do what Eleanor Roosevelt uh, told us to do so long ago, and that is do something every day that scares you. That kind of a discipline will actually help you and prepare you for the really big scary things that inevitably will come in life. You'll be ready for it. And uh, so that's good. So uh, one of the, the stories that we're going to pull from the word today, I'm not going to read directly from it because it's four chapters, but today we're going to talk about the story of Jonah, how Jonah teaches us that God's call for us is scary and that that's an okay thing. So today, uh, so, so in the book of Jonah, in Jonah, uh, he's asked to go to Nineveh and preach to them that 40 more days will come and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, we just hear Nineveh, whatever, it's some random city. But Nineveh was uh, a very scary thing. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And actually, the Akkadian Assyrian Empire uh, was this unbelievably evil empire. Actually, it was uh, right up there with uh, the Nazis and the Mongols as, you know, probably will go in the annals of history. Maybe it's the worst ever, worse than even those two. The Akkadian Assyrian Empire lasted 2,500 years. I'm just going to pause there for a dramatic <laughs> pregnant pause. 2,500 years. When you think about how long that is, that would be like from Alexander the Great until now, that imagine that the Macedonian Empire had lasted that long. That was how long the Akkadian Assyrian Empire uh, existed. It stretched across uh, what's today Iraq, parts of Iran and the Levant, it was this massive empire, incredibly powerful, incredibly wealthy, and most importantly, incredibly ruthless. They were known to do things like they would go into a town and they would not just kill everybody by the sword, but they would skin them alive. Then they would take the skins and put them on poles outside of the city so that anybody who came by would see what happens if you have the Assyrians as your enemy. They tortured people, impaled people, lit people on fire. They had no care for, they didn't care if you were a child, they didn't care if you were an old person. Everybody died uh, hor horribly under the sword of the Akkadian Assyrian Empire. And this is how, really, they established empire. They were the first empire, and they, almost every empire after them copied that. So you have the Babylonians, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Romans, etc. And every um, almost every great empire, probably every great empire in human history has been ruthless and, and done this type of thing, and that's how they control their people. So, but there's nobody that's ever been worse than the Assyrians. And right at the heart of the Akkadian Assyrian Empire is this city called Nineveh, which in the very, very old world was one of the biggest, most amazing cities ever. In fact, actually, there's this incredible account of Xenophon, a general of 10,000 men from Greece who has these mercenaries and he's fighting for Greece against the Persians and they, they lose and they're retreating and running away and they end up going through the, the desert, this very dramatic story, and they stumble upon these ruins that are unlike anything they had ever seen. They come upon a city that's completely empty and it's half buried in sand. Xenophon says in his account, so this is 400 BC, it's 200 years after the fall of the Assyrian Empire, he says to them that there was this city with walls higher than I'd ever seen. And these are true, by the way. 50 feet thick, 150 feet tall. Now, there's rumors that actually they used to raise horses on top of this wall. That's how thick it was. And he says the parameter of the city is 18 miles long. 18 miles. And... Uh, they, they, they're looking at this city, and it would almost be like, imagine we were in the Middle East, and you were in the military or something, and you stumbled upon some alien, futuristic city that was in ruins, like it had been uncovered under a lake or something. You'd be like, what is this? And this is what's happening to Xenophon, because he has no idea what this is. And by the way, the locals don't either. They say it's a city called, I think it was Lylasa or something like that. And they said, oh, it was a, a, a Midian city. Well, that's actually not even true. They had stumbled upon the 200 
Now, it had been devastated 200 years ago, the ruins of the city of Nineveh. And the reason nobody knew what it was is because Nineveh was so evil, so wicked, that when a band of armies, including the Scythians, who are like, they predate the Mongols, they're like these horse people with bows and arrows, the Scythians, the Persians, the Babylonians, and a, a group of all these other nations, ganged up on Nineveh, barely won, and when they won, they burned the city to the ground, they destroyed everything, every man, woman, and child, because they wanted the Assyrians to be gone forever, because they were so afraid. And they literally did wipe them out from history. I'm actually surprised how few high schoolers and college students are ever taught or hear about this important part of human history. So anyway, that's the city where Jonah's supposed to go. <laughs> that's what God wants Jonah to do. God says, Jonah, I want you to go there to Nineveh, where maybe Ashurbanipal is, or these people who like murder, torture, in horrific ways their enemy. I want you to go there and walk into the middle of the city and tell them that it's coming under God's judgment. We, you know, speaking of judgment, we judge Jonah a lot, don't we? But that's a scary thing to do. Some Jewish guy just hobbling on into, you know, Nineveh. And so what does, what does uh, Jonah do? He says, nope, I'm out of here. And gets on a boat and he sails to Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is about, as, do we have a map? It's about as far away from Nineveh. <laughs> Tarshish is in Spain, okay? It's in Spain, 2,500 miles away. It's like, as, it's the end of the earth. It's like, I'm just going to get as far away from Nineveh and God and everything else uh, as I can. So Jonah gets on this boat and he sails and he's trying to just get as far away. From, he's scared out of his mind. And all of a sudden, this huge storm comes. Everybody's freaking out. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, the sailors come down, and they're like, what is going on? It says they cast lots, and I don't even know what this means, but somehow the lots point to Jonah. And they ask Jonah, what is this about? And he says, yep, the Lord told me to go to Nineveh, and I'm just trying to get out of Dodge as fast as possible. He says, throw me overboard, and everything will be fine. And they do. They throw him overboard. And we don't know what it is, a, a whale or a fish. And we actually don't know if this is meant to be a historical story. It could be a parable like the Good Samaritan or something. But there are 700,000 creatures in the ocean that you can see with sonar that still haven't been identified. So I like to think it's some like really cool. I like to think it is true. And it's, it's, we don't even know what it was. But anyway, uh, so, so this thing, whatever it is, swallows Jonah. And while he's in the belly of this beast, has this three days, has this famous prayer to God of repentance and about God's grace and God's love and mercy. And at the end of the story, God has mercy on Jonah. And what is God's mercy to Jonah? Do you remember? Does he bring him to Tarshish? Does he finish the journey? No. He, the fish vomits Jonah on the shores of the Assyrian Empire. <laughs> Go. <laughs> That's God's mercy. God's mercy... Is to, God's mercy is to take Jonah and put him right in front of the scary thing he was called to face. That's God's mercy. I think if Jonah had actually made it to Tarshish, he would have spent his whole life feeling afraid. Maybe his whole life feeling regret. Maybe his whole life feeling guilt that he didn't do what he should have done when he was supposed to do it. Can't get any man. I think this is so true. I think that this is what God does to us. God when we run away from what God asks us to do because we're scared, don't worry. If you pray, he'll bring you back to the scary thing. That's what God does. That's how good God is. And what's even better is, so Jonah goes to Nineveh. He marches into the city. And actually, when you read the prophets in the Old Testament, all of the prophets are very, you know, they, sound, they almost sound like hip-hop lyrics, like everybody's going to die and you're going down and like, you know, and they'll go on for chapters about what's going to happen to generations and the fire and the this and the that and storms and winds and curses and like, and, and, it re and then people never turn, you know, in the Old Testament. They always laugh at God and then they come under judgment and yet in this story, Jonah says, and it really stands out to the Jewish and Old Testament reader, he just says one line, he says, 40 more days and Nineveh will fall. 
That's his whole prophecy. It's almost like when you read it, like he walks into the city and he's like, 40 more days and then I'm going to fall. <laughs> so it's like he, he almost, it almost feels like he barely says it, like he doesn't care. He almost doesn't want anybody to hear him. And then what's even funnier is the response is that the whole city goes into repentance. The king, the people, and not even just the people and the servants and the slaves, but the animals even have to repent and put on sackcloth and fast and they can't drink water. And so it's like the most successful prophecy ever because God even loves Assyrians. He's good, isn't he? And in this story, they, they turn and they repent and God relents of his, his wrath on, on this evil city. And it, what's interesting to me is that it's like, it's so clear that Jonah thought he was going to fail and die. And instead, um, even the, the thing that's even worse happens to him, the people actually repent, which is something he really feared. He, didn't, he wanted them to die. And so there was like all these layers of fear for Jonah. But the funny thing was that God, God's victory was in the end. That, that in the end it wasn't really, you know, Jonah was a part of God's plan. And God was going to make it happen no matter what. And I think so, so often when we see these scary things in our lives, we're always so worried that, you know, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. But when the bad things we're afraid of actually happen, part of the freedom that we get is realizing, well, that actually wasn't so bad. That was actually a little smaller than I thought. See, that's, that's how some of the anxiety gets diminished in our life when we do scary things, is that the things we're most afraid of actually happen sometimes. And then we're able to go, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. God's with you, and it'll be okay. Can we get an amen from people that have had to go through scary things? God, that may seem scary, but once we cross the bridge, it'll be all right. You know, I, I just think that God's plan for your life is scary. Um, if it's not a little scary, it's probably not from God. You know, it, 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 God always has these plans that he puts into our lives. And what, what happens is when we do even these little scary things, we get stretched. And we actually feel better after we do them. And even if the scary stuff happens, we're in, we end up being okay. In my book, I tell this story about, it's, it was like a defining moment for me when I was a, a kid. I was in fourth or fifth grade. I don't imagine any of you have been to Indian Village in Forest Home, have you? This was our, our church did this a lot when we were kids. I don't think they call it Indian Village anymore. But uh, anyway, they're still there. But they had this thing they called the blob. And I remember the first year I went, I saw this thing, the blob, and it was just like this giant inflatable rectangular pillow. There it is. Okay. The blob is amazing, first of all, and it, it, it's, it functions with the same physics that you would use kind of for a catapult, where you have one guy will sit on the right side of the blob, and then this guy on the platform on the left will jump and land on the left side of the blob, and as the air transfers from one side to the other, it shoots the guy on the end uh, into the air. And you can see this guy is like, what is, he got, he got up there. So as a kid, we had this thing at our, at our you know, things weren't as safe back then in the 80s and early 90s. It was a much better time to be a kid, just to be honest with you. And, I, and I, I, I'm there, and I'm looking at this blob thing, and I'm thinking, I got to do that. I got to do that. It looks awesome. That looks also scary. What if I get, what if I belly flop? What if I get a kid, and I get launched into the air? And I'm just like, all this stuff is going through my mind. And so I'm just like staring at the blob. I'm like, I got I to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And I just keep talking and keep talking and spinning my wheels. And do I do it? No. I pass, and like a whole year goes by, and every once in a while I think about this blob thing, and was it fun, it would have been cool. Well, the next year, our youth pastor, one of the guys that went with our youth group or children's group, was this guy we called Big Mike. He was a Pacific Islander. He looked like Maui from uh, Moana. Um, if you've got little kids, you know exactly what this guy looks like. And he was awesome. He, like, all the kids loved him. He was so full of joy and life, and he had all these cool tattoos, and he was really Hawaiian, and in this vibe, you know, it was just a good guy. And, and like all of us looked up to him. And I remember, same thing, next year, I'm standing and I'm looking at this blob thing again, kind of scared, kind of wanting to do it. And Mike comes up and he's like, you want to go on that blob, don't you? And I was like, yeah, I do. He's like, you should go on that. I was like, I know I should, but I don't know. It kind of looks kind of scary. He's like, you should do it. Like, he's like, come on, let's do it. You should go do it, man. I was like, 
He's like, I'll watch. You go do it. I was like, okay, all right, I'll go. So I go, and I'm really scared now. And I'm like, you know, this platform, you know, it, it doesn't look that high from here. But if you've ever been on top of a platform looking down, it does get scarier. And I'm standing up there looking down. And then all of a sudden, I see this little kid at the end of the blob. And he looks back at me terrified. And somehow that made all of my fear go away. And I turn into this, like, wolf. And I'm like, yeah! And I jump, and I launch this kid. And it feels so empowering and awesome. And then I kind of, like... Scoot to the end, and I'm wondering who's coming up behind me. And then I turn back, and it's 240 pound Big Mike. And I look back, and I'm like, oh no. And I go, Mike! And keep in mind, I'm like nine or 10. You know, I'm like a little guy. I'm skin and bones Jones. I am just like the littlest. And I go, Mike, no! Mike, no! No! And he does this, like, ah! You know, jumps from the platform, lands, and I'm like, Mike, no! And like, there was so much, like you feel the wind and the air, and I kind of, I don't really know, it wasn't a, I don't think you'd call it a flip, that sounds too elegant. <laughs> it, it's kind of like, imagine a cat being launched or something like that. Spra it was more of a sprawling. <laughs> and when I hit the water, it was like a pancake hitting a pan. It was brutal, and it hurt, and I was angry and freaked out. And so, and so let me just say this. Everything bad that I was afraid of, you know, a big person coming after, a big guy, bigger than a fat kid, it was a fat grown up, you know? And, I, and, and getting launched high in the air and belly flopping and all that stuff, it all happened, all of it. All the, as the worst version of everything I was afraid of happened. And when I got out of the water, how do you think I felt? Yeah, I didn't feel, I didn't feel more scared, I didn't feel frustrated, I was in pain and laughing, <laughs> right? See, see, that's what happens when we do scary stuff in, in life is, you know, something changes within us, just a little bit. You know, the, the, the worry and the fear that I had about this thing I really wanted to do, it went away. And by the way, we just kept doing the blob all day, right? Because now we're not afraid anymore. I had the biggest guy in the group launch me, right? In fact, I wanted him to do it again, see if I could get higher. <laughs> and this is, this is the change, is that we go from worry to desire to do more. Our world gets bigger when we do scary things. Our world gets, see, everything seems more possible when we do scary things. Something changes in our thinking, and then that changes the rest of our life. And by the way, I think this is why kids are generally happier than adults is because they don't get a choice. They have to do scary stuff all the time. Last uh, final thought. Don't feel like you have to go it alone. Remember, the only way I was able to overcome the blob is to have this guy, this friend, Mike, who believed in me and encouraged me to do it. Remember, when Jesus sent people out, he didn't send them out one by one. He sent them out two by two so that all the scary stuff they were asked to do, they did in community. It's good to have friends in your life that are brave and encourage you to do brave things. I don't like the hero stories that many of us have. I like stories like Lord of the Rings. In, in Lord of the Rings, you know, you, you have a, a guy like Frodo Baggins. Sorry, I'm going down the nerd hole here for a second, but you know, he has a, Frodo has a Gandalf. And then you've got this other guy, Strider, who's a, who's a king, and, and he's not able to become a king until these people enter into his life. And so, Stories like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars are not about one person. They're about a group of friends that do scary things together. I don't like the modern stories of the Lone Rangers that have to do scary things all by themselves. Nobody's asking you to do that. God's not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to do that. I am asking you to do scary things, and I'm, I'm telling you that if you get good friends in your life that are joyful, loving, compassionate, and brave, you're going to do a lot braver things in your life, and you're going to enjoy the victory when you cross that line. So today, I encourage you to do what Eleanor Roosevelt said, what the Word tells us to do, and that is to do something scary every day. Even stuff that, does, that may not be godly. I mean, if, if there are things in your life that are kind of scary, just go do them. Expand your world. Expand your thinking. Train yourself. Because as we do little scary things every day, we prepare ourselves to do the really big scary things that come once in a lifetime. And when that happens, we'll be ready. Amen? You know, God's call to your life is scary. Don't be, don't be worried. God's going to get you where you need to be. Everything's going to be okay. So, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you that you love us. I pray for everybody here who's fa facing something scary 
or something that they're worried about, maybe something at work, maybe it's something small, like they gotta do a project for work tomorrow, or uh, maybe for, for the younger, young people here in college, uh, maybe they have a test or finals, or, or things like that. Lord, we, we just pray in Jesus' name that you would give us freedom and the, and, and the power uh, to charge these things. And give us friends, Lord, to help us get there. Fill us with your spirit. And uh, Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We all face various mountains in our lives. For some, the mountain is debt. For others, it's sickness or pain. Whatever your mountain, it can seem imposing, defeating and demoralizing. I want to encourage you today. Every single mountain you face is an opportunity to draw closer to God and watch Him do something miraculous and wonderful. Scripture is filled with examples of people who faced seemingly impossible situations with great faith. They spoke to their mountain and saw God move on their behalf. That is right. A great example is David facing Goliath. He faced Goliath head on and said, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. David stepped out in bold faith and spoke to his mountain. We all face mountains in our lives, situations that seem impossible to overcome, but there's hope. Every mountain we face is an opportunity for God to do something amazing. Today, with your generous gift of any size, request Pastor Bobby's two-message audio collection, Move Your Mountain, The Power of Big Faith. Be encouraged to face the mountains in your life with power and authority. You'll also receive the booklet, Faith Comes by Hearing, filled with scriptures on key topics like anxiety, finances, and healing. This booklet will help you build your faith for whatever mountain you're facing in your life. Call or go online today, and for your generous gift of any size, we'll send you Bobby's two-message CD series, Move Your Mountain, plus the scripture-filled booklet, Faith Comes by Hearing. Request these empowering resources today and learn how to face the mountains in your life with bold faith. Our ministry is in the midst of some urgent financial needs. In fact, we're facing our own mountain. We want to continue being a blessing and minister to as many people as possible. But I have to tell you that the rising costs of airtime constantly threaten our ability to keep this program on the air. You may not realize it, but we have to cover the expenses for every single minute of airtime on the station where you view Hour of Power. That's why we must rely on friends like you to keep this hope-filled program coming into homes across America and around the world. You know, there are people who have never heard about the love of Jesus Christ, but because of you, they can. So thank you for prayerfully standing with us and supporting us during this urgent time.